Guys, three stocks at 52-week lows. We're going to take a look at them. A great place to start looking for value is to check out stocks that have hit 52-week lows. If they're on the way down, there might be a mispricing there, so you can check them out. Stock number one, AstraZeneca, biopharmaceutical. Now, in this world of biopharmaceutical, it's not just about cash flow. It is about cash flow, but it's also about that future cash flow. Because remember, we always say that every investment is the present value of all future cash flow. When it comes to these biotech companies and the ones that have drugs, you have to know what's in their pipeline, right, Mo? We've yeah. talked about this so many times. Now, the great thing about AstraZeneca is a couple of things. One, only a third of their revenue comes from the U.S. And two, they have a very wide range of diseases they fight, diabetes, cardiovascular, cancer, and some other mm -hmm. rare diseases, uh, respiratory, things like that. So yep. it's a great place to look. Now, this is a $200 billion market cap business, okay? And the enterprise value is 254. That difference is 50 billion, 55 billion. That's roughly the debt they have on hand. And here's the issue I have, Mo. Look at this. Last year's free cash flow was 7.24 billion in the last 12 months. Their five-year average was 4 billion. That's a lot more. It's a lot more. So we have to understand <laughs> why is that? And even, even though it's a lot more there, look, look, look at your five-year average of four. That difference of $54 billion, that's, almost, that's 12 plus years of free cash flow you have to eat up just to get them back to basically they're essentially their debt. That's a lot to me. All right. Now, their PE, currently 34. Their five-year PE is 32. Okay. Profit margin. Now, here's the interesting part, Mo. Okay. This is probably what it is. Even though their profit and cash flow is, is higher in the last year, their profit margin is actually lower than the last five years. Hmm. That's interesting. That's very interesting. So what does that yeah. mean to me? Was there an acquisition? Acquisition. So there was a $9.4 billion acquisition in 2021. They've made two acquisitions in 2022 and 23 for a billion dollars each. Okay. So look at this. Look at their revenue. Going back to 18, 21 and a half, 24, 25.9, 33, 45, 45. Yep. So this big jump, a couple of big jumps here, were they acquisitions? I'm not against that. It explains the big jump in free cash flow. It explains the jump in net income. And by the way, their free cash flow was over double their net income, which is a huge plus. Now, we want companies that can grow organically. I'm okay with acquisition growth as long as it's done intelligently, but we want to make sure they can grow organically by themselves. If they stopped acquiring other places, if they stopped selling divisions off, can they still grow? So the question in the pharmaceutical world is, what's in the pipeline? Mo, let's go over that. So they have 178 projects right now in the pipeline. And you can see how they break it down here. And as Paul mentioned earlier, oncology, cardiovascular, respiratory, rare diseases. So the top three drugs, number one is Farziga. It's 13% of their revenue. These patents expire 2025 in the United States, 2023 in China, so they expired there already, and 2027 in the EU, 2025 in Japan. So it's the reason I'm going through this, it's important to understand when these expire because the revenue is going to stop. You're going to have competition in there coming in from all of the generics, right, Paul? Yeah. And, and by the way, the revenue won't go to zero, but it'll drop 90% it'll a lot of times. Significantly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, it's still, people still will pay for a real drug for the, for the name brand at some point, but the generics will really attack that revenue. So now here I have two more drugs. Tegriso, 13% of revenue. These all expire in the 2030s, 2032, oh, great. 2034 in Europe, Japan, et cetera. And Imfizni, same thing in the 2030s. So those are two drugs that make up 13% of revenue that don't have, have any expirations in the 2020s. So Mo, just crazy. to clarify, do all three drugs get, have 13% of revenue total or is it the first one was 13 right. and the next two were 13 combined? 13%, second one's 13%, last one is 9% of total revenue. Okay, so the, the 13 and 9%, 22%, they ain't expiring soon. Yep. The first drug at 13%, that is going to be off the books here in the next few years. So yeah. the question is, what do they have in phase one, phase two, and phase three? Remember guys, when it comes to getting drugs approved, there are three levels, phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one is the initial stages. At phase three, the likelihood of getting approved is like 55 or 60%. But it's not just about, is it going to get approved? Is it marketable? Right. That's the big key. If the market's not big enough, 
if it's really not that useful, it doesn't matter if it's a phase three. So this is where, when it comes to biotech, before you go buy into these biopharmaceuticals, I mean, make sure you understand how marketable these drugs are. So Mo, what do they have in these phase? Oh, look at that list. That's great. So you can see the phase breakdown here. A lot in phase one, a lot in phase two. But what I really like, watch when I scroll here, phase three, they have a lot of phase Ooh, three drugs. Wow. So that's really great. And you can see that they're already starting to do combinations with their phase two with the phase three, three drugs that they have. So this is a very active company. They've been around for such a long time. They do a great job. And it's really nice to see that they have a lot of drugs in phase three that are probably marketable based on what I'm seeing right here. So guys, this is the eight pillars on AstraZeneca. It's rough, but remember, this five-year PE and five-year price of free cash flow are probably skewed too high. I like the fact that the, the price of free cash flow is lower than the PE, but remember, this is in fact this this only factors in partial of the acquisitions. 18% um, increased number of shares that could have been because of the acquisition. The debt level does bother me a little bit. So guys, again, these this this eight pillars doesn't really tell you much. So guys, for us to really figure out whether we really want this company or not, I'm going to look at the market cap here and the $7 billion in free cash flow, 200 divided by 17, that is almost a 30 um, P, um, price to free cash flow. So unless those phase three drugs are gonna mm -hmm. absolutely kill it and skyrocket the revenue and profit imminently, I just don't even think to myself, I'm not even interested in looking at this company until a little bit later. Stock number two, another biopharmaceutical business, Biogen. And this is one we've covered in the past that was interesting to us. Biogen was getting approvals on Alzheimer's. Now I'm going to let Mo take over on this one because he, you know, Mo spent two years in med school. Both our fathers are physicians and he stayed much more in the medical field than I did. Talk about Biogen. <laughs> so the, they had this lacanumab and this was, it, I'm sure all of you that have heard of Biogen that have not heard of it in the past, you heard of it because of this. It was the most controversial passing of any drug ever by the FDA. A lot of people said that the drug shouldn't have passed, it did. And it passed because there's not a lot of treatments out there for Alzheimer's and dementia. And this was a shot. It was a shot for people in with a, a, a late stage of the disease, but it passed anyways. Now, the interesting thing about them, they do have a lot of great drugs. They have just been completely dominated in the news by the Alzheimer's and dementia drugs that have gone through. So we're going to look at where their drug revenue come from and, and is this thing actually a driver of revenue? That's the real question. So let's go over some high levels here, Mo. So here's something interesting. Free cash flow in the last 12 months, 1.25 billion. In the last five years, 3.2. Big drop. Profit, 1.16 versus 3.13. Now, I like the fact that net income and free cash flow are essentially the same. And look at this, though. Five-year profit margin of 26.6%, one-year profit margin of 11.8. So why was there a big drop? Let's go check out the income statement because I really want to understand this. Revenues declined. Okay, it's a little bit low. 14.4, 13.4, 11, 10, 9.8. So it is declining here in the last five years. Is it because they're losing drugs? That is partially my guess there. Um, but that's something, and other income expenses, $564 million charge. Kind of eats up a little bit. Not a huge, not enough to account for the more than 50% drop in profit, but enough where it matters here. Um, all right, this is, they probably lost some drugs along the way. Let's look at their eight pillars. Not as bad as AstraZeneca, but again, AstraZeneca's was a little skewed. Again, five-year PE, 10 and 10, seems awesome. But again, we saw a big drop in their free cash flow and net income over the last five years. So it's something to be a little cautious about. This company has been selling for a, quite the tight trading range over the last five years. Even though it's down 34% in the last five years from five years ago, look how flat this is. Look at this trading range, Mo. Yeah. I mean, it's, this has been in such a tight range. It's one of the most volatile and non-volatile stocks at the same time. <laughs> volatile in the short run, very consistent trading range in the long run. Yeah. So Mo, go over their, 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 what their drugs in the pipeline are. So I'm going to go through top three drugs that they have as a percentage of revenue. They have the first one, Tysabri, 26% of their revenue. Wow. Now their patents expire 2024 through 2034, uh, depending where you are in the world. So that's a big one. So you need to understand what's their percentage of revenue in the U.S. on that drug versus the world. If 90% of that drug's revenue is in the U.S., that is not good. If 90% yeah. of it's in the rest of the world and expires in 2034, that's fine. 
These are yeah. the things. This is why investing in biopharmaceuticals is a lot more work than just looking at like the, the third company we're going to look at shortly. Go ahead, Mo. Mm -hmm. Second one, Spinraza, 24% of revenue, 2025 through 2034 expiration dates, Again. depending where we are in the world. Again. And then the last one is Tecfidera. You might have seen commercials for this one. It's for relapsing multiple sclerosis, 14% of revenue expiring 2024 through 2028. One more thing I want to throw in. Yeah. That drug, um, Lacanumab for Alzheimer's and, and dementia, they're expecting 12.8 billion in revenue through 2028. So that's not a really high driving revenue drug. $12.8 okay. billion dollars over the next four years. That's yeah, but great. Mo, that's still $3 billion a year on a company that's doing $10 billion. That could be a 30% jump in revenue. It is. And, and you know what? Maybe, I mean, if the drug actually begins to work or they make adjustments to it or whatever, it could gain a bigger market cap. Uh, I'm sorry, a bigger percentage of revenue because that is a very big disease out there, especially in the States. And as the average age... Yeah. Of the of people increases because life expectancy increases, you're going to see a lot more drugs for dementia, Alzheimer, cancers, things like that. You know, not many people 100 years ago were dying of cancer because people weren't living long enough to really They're get amazing. cancer. Yeah, mm -hmm. so the longer and longer our life expectancy increases, the more and more likely that people have these kind of big ailments dementia, Alzheimer's, cancer, etc. Stock number three. And one we're going to actually do the stock analyzer tool on, Hormel Foods. For those of you who don't know, it is, they're the creators of one of the classiest foods you'll ever eat in your life, Spam. So let's check out Hormel Foods. We've all had Spam. Mo, you've had Spam, right? I actually have never had Spam. You've never had Spam? No. You absolute snob. I've never even thought to open that weird looking can and eat some. <laughs> I actually but think they it do have the good. best canned chili out there. Hormel does? Yeah. So guys, Hormel Foods, $16 billion market cap, $20.85 billion enterprise value. That difference of $4 billion is, their, is essentially their, their net debt. They did $780 million in free cash flow last year. $760 is their five-year um, average. Very consistent. Not much of a grower. Uh, more of a shower. A shower. Pro profit margin last five years, 8.3%. Last year, 6.6. .6. So down a little bit last year. PE and price of free cash flow about the same. Huge dividend, Mo. 3.7% eats up $600 million of their $700 million in cash flow. Ooh. Low return on invested capital. So thank oh, you very so much. good at it. So, so good. Thank you very much for distributing money and dividends and not wasting it doing stupid things. Um, so far, I'm kind of like, wow, why is it selling for such a premium on such a slow growth company? Let's go check out the income statement. So 20 times earnings for a company that's not growing very much. This was clearly an acquisition here, Mo. When it jumped from 9.6 to 11.4 billion in these two years, clearly there had to be an acquisition. So let's go check out the cash flow statement. Oh uh, yeah, right here. 2021, ah, 3.4 billion. It's quite the acquisition. Planters snacking business. Oh wow, really? Including planters, nut trip nutrition, planters, cheese balls, corn nuts. I love corn nuts. You do love corn nuts. Sure. Let's go check out their eight pillars. Five checks. Like we said, I don't like the fact that their price of free cash from the last five years is higher than the PE, but it's not too far off. Bad ROIC. Barely increased their shares outstanding. Might have been from the acquisition. Who knows? Net income drop, but cash flow growth in the last five years. So that's good. Um, nothing that I'm writing home. I, I'm looking at this going, eh. Analysts are looking for... $1.71 this year in earnings going up to two sixty seven by two at the end of twenty twenty seven. Revenue growth, pretty boring. Low single digits. Makes sense. So let's do the stock analyzer tool. Now, guys, you've seen a lot of this. You've seen the software. You haven't even touched all the tools we have here. All these tools are available in our software. If you're interested, we have a seven-day free access, full trial, full free access for free seven days at everythingmoney.com. Go check it out. You'll have the community. You'll have all these tools back here. Everythingmoney.com. Go check it out. Okay. Mo, give me some, yes. uh, we're going to do a 10 year analysis here. Give me uh, your revenue growth assumptions for Hormel Foods. I was thinking one, three and five. I like it. Not going to be sexy. My guess is the revenue is going to go up with inflation yeah. because as things cost more, they're going to increase their prices, et cetera. Profit mm -hmm. margin. I did six, seven, and eight. See, I think that's too low. Here's why, okay. Mo. 
five and 10 year, they're at eight and a half percent essentially. So I think you're really butchering it. I, I would, I would prefer seven, eight, nine, seven, eight, nine. I still All think right. eight's on the low side, but are you okay with that? That's fine. Okay. What about free cash flow margin? Um, it's slightly lower. Yep. How does six and a half, uh, seven and a half, eight and a half go? Yep. Cause it's not that much lower. All right. Now low return on invested capital, high dividend, and not much of a grower. What PE would you assign to this in 10 years? And what price of free cash flow? 12, 4, 11, 11, 13, 15. I agree. Now, guys, you yeah. might sit there and say, there's an argument to be made that they have a good brand of, of, of foods. So give them a higher PE. But this is, this is you're not going to get your money. You have to get your money from the dividend. You have to get your money from paying a very low multiple for it and hoping that the market just gives it a higher multiple at some point. Low Maybe return on invested there. capital and decreasing return on invested capital. This means yeah. that as time goes on, they're doing a worse job with the money. Yep. We don't want to give them a high multiple for that. You might disagree with me, and that's the, that's the great part of investing. Mo, what's your desired return for this company? And this desired return will include the dividend. Okay. So do we want to use margin of safety here, do you think? No, let's, do, let's not do margin of safety here. Let's okay. just do, because we already, I think we did a little margin of safety on the PE. With the PE so we're just yeah. going to do the 9% return. So guys, okay. if you want to get essentially the long-term return on the market for the next 10 years at 9%, we put it in there. The stock's currently at 29. And don't forget, guys, everythingmoney.com, free seven-day full access trial. The stock's currently at 29. All right, we have a low price of 16 or 17, a high price of 33 to 35, middle price of 23 to 25. And again, this all includes the dividend and not much margin of safety. So guys, thank you very much for your time.